wish you all happy National Caregivers Month of November and welcome to the Caregiving in a Pandemic, Accessing Benefits and Support Sessions. My name is Joey Costello. I use he, him pronouns and I am the Assistant Director of Care Management at SAGE and I will be moderating our time together today. SAGE, Advocacy and Services for LGBTQ plus elders is excited to be co-hosting this event with the Diverse Elders Coalition and the National Alliance for Caregiving. This webinar is made possible with generous support from the John A. Hartford Foundation. We are very excited to spend some time with you this afternoon or on the morning if you're joining from the West Coast. And our goal for today's webinar is to offer tools, resources, and community in supporting all of you as caregivers and or care recipients during the pandemic. Some quick Zoom etiquette. Please keep yourself on mute so that everyone is able to hear the discussion. Uh, if you have questions, please feel free to enter them in the chat as some of you already have. And we'll try to get through some of those towards the end, time permitting during our Q&A session. We'll also have a few polling questions throughout our presentations that we ask you to participate in um, so we can get a better sense of where caregivers are during the pandemic and all across the country. Also a reminder, this session will be recorded for caregiving training and outreach purposes. We are so glad that you were able to join us today and we thank you for your time. It is my pleasure to introduce one of our very own caregivers, Karen Ansis, who has a BA from the State University of New York at Buffalo and an MA in community planning from the University of Rhode Island. She retired in 2018 after 25 years of service at the New York Landmarks Conservancy. She is now the primary caregiver for her mother, Miriam, lovingly referred to as Mimi, who is now 97 years old and a long and a long-term resident of Amsterdam Nursing Home, near to where Karen lives now. Karen, please share your story with us. Thank you, Joey, and thank you everyone for coming and joining us. Um, the slide is uh, photos of Mimi over the last 18 months or so. And you see she is very cute no matter where she is. Um, uh, I'm, I'm going to, to, to enable my story to be told cogently and within a, a, a reasonable time frame that's been given to me. Uh, I'm going to sort of, after a, a brief background, uh, break it up into three parts that are interrelated, the three major actors in the saga, uh, the nursing home, my mother, and myself. So um, without further ado, um, I am an only child, so I'm, I'm the only person who takes care of my mother, really, but I have help with friends, of course. Um, my mother lived fairly independently in Brooklyn, New York, uh, until she was 95, until the spring of 2019, when she came down with acute pneumonia and was hospitalized. Uh, she miraculously recovered somehow uh, and entered. I transferred her to Amsterdam Nursing Home, which is a facility near me so that I could see her uh, every day if need be. I, I live in Manhattan, so it was very easy to go there on a walk. Up until then, um, you know, she has a, a, a sister who is three years younger and um, Mimi and her sister, I, 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 would put, I would put them against anyone in terms of their mental acuity. They were great girls. They grew up in the depression. They didn't go to college, um, but they could, they, had they gone, I'm sure that the world would be a better place for it. Uh, in the end, they ended up with uh, two families, my aunt and uncle and my mother and father, ended up doing a joint dry cleaning store business in Brooklyn for most of their lives. Um, in any event, most of the rest of 2019 uh, uh, really came down to uh, her, her um, like going home, uh, going back into the hospital, going into rehab, and then finally in January, uh, of this year, I made the decision, which was rather wrenching, to keep her in long-term care. Her main physical issue is uh, COPD, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. It's a deteriorating uh, respiratory uh, condition, and it is not going to be get any better. As you recall, in, in New York City, at the beginning of the pandemic, we got hit really hard here, and uh, both the, the healthcare systems were unprepared and, um, and overburdened. There was no PPE or very little. 
There were no COVID tests, essential, essential supplies were inadequate. Um, it, was, it, was it was rather chaotic. Um, the state policymakers really didn't know how to handle the overflow uh, in uh, the nursing homes either and the, on the hospitals, but they allowed transfers between the two, not really understanding that the most vulnerable population uh, was the, 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 the residents in the nursing homes. There were many, many deaths that were probably needless. Um, the state kind of owned up to it in the end. They passed some law regulation uh, ex exempting the nursing homes from liability from COVID deaths. And, and things got better as people learned how to deal with the pandemic a bit more. Um, but most importantly in all of this, uh, the staff at the nursing homes were also contracting COVID. So you had a lot of reduced staff. People couldn't go to work. They, they died just like the residents did. So on to Amsterdam Nursing Home, um, which was considered actually one of the better facilities in New York City. And uh, in, in mid-March, uh, they did a telephone blast to relatives and caregivers saying that there was a lockout uh, and nobody could enter the facility. Uh, they provided no further information. And then just a few weeks later, I got a call from my mom's doctor, you know, having that talk about uh, advanced directives and palliative care. That is, if someone at, at, at her age uh, and fragility, uh, they were not going to do anything to keep her alive if she got COVID. She would go on to palliative care. And frankly, with COPD, um, had she contracted COVID, I think she wouldn't last for more than a few hours. It, it, it hits the respiratory uh, system, which is already compromised in, in Mimi's case. The nursing home was then silent for two months. They didn't do anything. Um, they uh, Ultimately in May, they sent a telephone blast telling us that there are now statistics available uh, to caregivers, uh, which will, where you can track COVID positive tests and, and COVID uh, people uh, in the facility for both residents and staff. And I monitored that. And, uh, you know, it, it was clear that, uh, you know, like every few days, because there are 500 uh, staff people and hundreds of residents, somebody is going to be uh, going to test positive with COVID and all of that, even though by May, uh, New York was doing a great job of getting COVID under control. Um, and in early July, the state issued new regulations for possible nursing home visitations. The, the primary one was that facilities could, uh, could uh, do outdoor visits uh, only if for 28 days there were no COVID positive tests for residents and staff. And of course, that was not possible. Uh, there was regular testing now. And as I said, somebody was always being tested positive. And my thought at this point was, you know, uh, I'm never going to see my mother again at, um, at this rate, you know, or not for several months, you know. It was extremely disturbing. And I wanted more information from the nursing home. And I called them and I emailed them and they just stonewalled me. They, they were totally unresponsive. Um, they did not want to uh, respond to the public at all. And they didn't want to initiate anything that would provide us with any further information. They may not have any, but they could have done more than whatever they did. The only good news in July is that FaceTime for me uh, video calls uh, were instituted by the staff at the nursing home. So I could now see my mother. Um, I, uh, uh, one of the staff had come in with an iPad and call me and I could see mom. And you can see that I think the third slide there is her at this point and a picture of me on, uh, on, on the FaceTime call. Uh, at first, she actually thought that I was in the room when she saw me on the iPad. You know, she couldn't really differentiate between what she was looking at and my being um, my, my not being there. And finally in September, the nursing home was able to fit, do a finesse about the 28 day rule. They said we as visitors could stand outside on the sidewalk um, uh, and have, and they would take our loved ones down into the garden. And there's, there's a wrought iron fence between the two. And since we weren't on the property line, uh, there was no, there was, they weren't, uh, uh, they weren't uh, non-complying with any of the regulations. So we had a few visits that way. The first one was a morass where you've got these elderly people in a row with families lined up outside in the street, yelling at each other over the fence because everybody, the, the, the residents are hard of hearing, 
there everybody's wearing masks there's street noise it was a raucous circus and it, it was totally unsatisfactory the next two visits went fairly smoothly it was quieter and and more congenial so uh by now they've stopped doing outdoor visits in part because uh, it's too cold out to do it, and, and partly because they really want to comply with regulations to the greatest extent possible. So that was the nursing home and what they did and didn't do in all of this. As for my mom and her isolation, um, when, as I said, when she was there in February, I could visit her every day. Uh, and I took care of providing her with a telephone for the hearing impaired, a TV, clean clothes, crocheting materials, and so forth. I did her wash. It was not possible to do those things in the lockout. Um, I, could, I could also, most importantly, run down the nurses and doctors and whoever else I needed to do at the, see at the facility in order to get her the best care possibly because everybody needs an advocate. You know, these people, my mom, the, the older people are not able to ask for what they need themselves and they can't even relay, relay what's happened to them very accurately because they don't remember. Um, so now uh, my mom didn't have me and she didn't have an advocate. The, the, the nursing home's lockout confined the residents to their rooms with no group activities and with minimal physical therapy and occupational therapy, at, if at all. So uh, the residents had nothing to do. What do they do? They stare at the ceiling and, and get their needs met in a minimal way, but basically they didn't do very much. Um, you know, and on the other hand, there was reduced staff uh, at this point in the beginning, uh, and the, the staff could only spend a minimal amount of time to do basic services. They couldn't sit there and chat with people and, and, and gauge their moods and make them cheery or anything else, even though my mom's pretty cheery. Um, most of the residents, as I said, are hard of hearing, and even if they have roommates, they can't really engage with somebody across a room very well. They wave at each other at most. And normally, my mom would watch television because she couldn't hear. She would watch CNN and read the banners, uh, you know, on, on the TV. So she she could understand the news pretty well. And then, um, and she watched the uh, a Turner Classic Movie Station, which had the black and white movies from the 30s and 40s. And for those movies, she, she's seen them so many times, she knows the dialogue and she knows all the, the actors and actresses and all of that. So she doesn't need to hear it really, but it, it keeps her company. And the only problem is, is that she often lost her remote, you know, and at this point she's not really either, she's not able to ask for the remote or there's nobody around to get the remote. It's not clear, but often she didn't have the television on for some reason or another. Um, I spoke with her, I tried it a few times a day and, and my friends and family called her. I, I try to get everybody kind of to call so that she would be stimulated to the greatest extent possible. Um, but from most of what I could gather, she was there alone, you know, and it was clear early on that her short-term memory was, was declining rapidly and that she often mixed up uh, the, her, her stories uh, with respect to something that happened when and where and to whom. It was a little bit of a chopped salad, so to speak. And her great, once great mental acuity uh, yeah, was also uh, eroding. She became more childlike. Um, she was still congenial with everybody, chatting up the staff whenever somebody came in the room, kidding around and even funny at times. Uh, everybody liked her, it seemed, in return. So that was the nice part. You know, she seemed to not complain about the staff. She thought everybody was nice. She even liked the food. She didn't complain about the food. When she remembered, she ate. She couldn't remember whether she ate lunch, dinner, or supper. She had no idea, really, what meal was before her or past her. Um, but she had great periods of lucidity, on the other hand. Uh, right before the election last week, she she said, "If Trump moves on, uh, if Trump wins, I'm moving to Europe." He, she didn't know that you can't go to Europe, and I'm sorry if I've just offended everybody anybody here. Um, but the, after that, she would she lapsed into some kind of nonsensical stuff that made no sense to me at all. Um, um, Karen, I, yes, my my bell is not being heard. But we are at the end of your 10 minutes. So you wanna... are. Oh my goodness. Yeah. That went so fast. Anyway, okay, I'll wrap it up. Um, my experience, I'm totally frustrated with the organization, uh, the, the, the 
the, the facility and their lack of communication. With my mom, I feel just intense sadness for her. Uh, it's heartbreakingly sad. Um, and to wrap it up for the most part with me, um, you know, I, I'm in the, I've been a, for a year now in the SAGE support, the caregiver support group. It's been tremendous for me. They're great people. They're caring for people who in some cases weren't even nice to them when they found out that they were gay. They're extraordinary and they're of great sustenance to me. I appreciate everything they've done. Caregiving is so hard during this uh, pandemic, harder than it ever was before. Um, and I, I appreciate them uh, at a very, very deep level. And I want to thank Sage a, for a zillion times over for providing this essential service to me. So I'll sign off now and thank you for listening and stay safe, everybody. Thank you, Karen. Thank you for sharing that very important story. And um, yeah, I just really appreciate that. You're great. Um, so as I mentioned before, throughout this session, we will um, ask a few questions to help inform potential services geared to caregivers. So um, if you're a caregiver or a care recipient, because I know uh, we have a few folks that are on the call, um, please take a minute to answer our first poll question. If you're joining us over the phone um, and not a computer, we'll reach out to you later. So first question, what have you what have been your biggest challenges as a caregiver related to COVID-19? Check all that apply. So you can choose more than one. And it looks like it's two questions in this poll. If you scroll down, uh, did you experience any positive outcomes from the pandemic? And we'll wait for the results to start populating. We're actually seeing some of the results come in. Thanks, I'm seeing 27 people have responded so far. So once we give it another minute or so, I can um, turn the results external facing. Ah. Thanks for clarifying, Lauren. So in the meantime, we get to look at these lovely pictures of Mimi. And it looks like Diane might be mentioning something not on the poll. Answers to do with decreased ability to travel to family. I think that, yeah, that's an important piece. Skylar's sharing some positive outcome of the pandemic. Um, their partner who they were caring for has fewer seizures and spending more time at home. That's great. Okay, we have some poll results. So looks like at the top, no surprise here, anxiety. 68% said anxiety has increased. That, that definitely makes sense. Um, right under that, we have increased isolation, followed by access to services, financial strains, yes, uh, job loss, it's very true. Um, to the second question, did you experience any positive outcomes from the pandemic? Um, Decreased commuting time, yep, absolutely. Roll out of bed onto that computer. Uh, lowered expenses, looks like another one. Uh, technology use, spending more time with family, absolutely. Let's see. In the box, we have a few that are mentioning uh, not being able to advocate. Um, during uh, emergency situations. I just got an email that is covering up these questions. Okay, it's gone. Uh, there we go.
Yeah, some good answers here. Okay, so now we are going to move on to, um, let's see, let me scroll down here. Okay, so we have our next presenter. Latoya Thomas is the Director of Policy and Government Affairs for Doctor On Demand and has a deep expertise in shaping statutory and regulatory policies nationwide that facilitate better delivery of care, cost reduction, internet connectivity, and transparency between consumers, providers, and insurers. Please welcome Latoya Thomas. Thank you, Joey. I, I think I can speak for everyone when I say we would love to have more Karen and more Mimi. I wish I could give my time to you, but um, <laughs> I do have to get through these slides, but hopefully um, you'll be able to share more about your experience uh, in the discussion. Um, I can say I, I can I can sympathize. Um, I have aging parents. My dad is my mom's primary caregiver. Uh, she has early stage dementia and is also a survivor of stage four lung cancer. So keeping her at home safely for as long as we can is certainly our priority. Um, next slide, please. Thank you. You know, with that said, uh, the multi-demics of COVID-19, uh, violent trauma, bigotry, uh, healthcare resource, and financial insecurity, I think, has left an indelible mark on all of us. Uh, there's a collective feeling of um, exhaustion, uh, anxiety, clearly, as indicated by the polls, um, with just a sliver of cautious optimism. Uh, and with infection, hospital, and death rates continuing to climb, as well as states rolling back their reopening plans, um, there are roughly 53 million family caregivers that are trying to cope with social isolation, physical and behavioral health, and financial challenges that they encounter daily. Next slide, please. Next slide. Thank you. You know, with the CDC's recommendation uh, to use telehealth whenever possible, um, you know, for us at Doctor in Demand, already having telehealth allowed us to quickly adapt to some of the access challenges that our patients and the broader healthcare community were experiencing. Uh, we are a telehealth practice. Uh, we provide 24-7 access to safe, quality, urgent care, primary care, um, and behavioral health services in all 50 states and DC through a suite of tools uh, such as video, uh, the phone or voice, uh, as well as secure messaging. Uh, we've also partnered over the past few months uh, with CareLinks, which provides professional in-home caregiving services um, to enable their clients to access telehealth much easier. Because of all this, we've been able to serve a vital public health role in mitigating the case of infectious disease spread and providing safe access to routine care to all who need it. Next slide, please. Thank you. Now, while we're all making sacrifices, we don't think you have to make any sacrifices on accessing routine health care, and that includes behavioral health. But this should also include the choice of your telehealth provider. Uh, so what are some of the, uh, the needs uh, that folks are needing from their healthcare experience? Certainly needing of these visits to be affordable and valuing your time. Uh, we're proud that the wait times for the average uh, telehealth visit at Doctor On Demand is between five to six minutes. And you can also schedule visits if it fits into your schedule, as opposed to having to wait um, four weeks or, or 10 weeks in the instance of behavioral health care. Um, certainly building a rapport and trust with your healthcare provider. We published a study a couple of months ago that highlighted uh, that building rapport and trust were the key drivers of patient satisfaction for these telehealth visits. Certainly listening, uh, having a provider who listens and provides guidance um, uh, through that visit and subsequent visits, being able to choose your health care or behavioral health provider. Um, we are really proud to be able to provide a directory of employed providers that you can read the descriptions of the services that they specialize in um, and get a better sense of what they look like, who they are, perhaps the languages that they speak and how they might be able to better take tailor those services for you. And of course, having a provider who can help manage and coordinate your care. 
whether it's sending uh, orders to your pharmacy electronically, uh, sending orders to the nearest lab, either for COVID tests uh, for, or for other labs or radiological needs that you might need, um, being able to seamlessly coordinate care with those entities, but also being able to care as coordinate care with any specialist uh, that you might see is certainly something that we're capable of doing with you and for you. And I think um, what is crucially important is that folks are looking for a healthcare and virtual care experience that ensures privacy, uh, the security of your information, and because we're all staying at home, and this gives you a seamless ability to connect with your provider at home, being able to ensure that it's done in an attentive environment. Uh, next slide, please. Now, with all that said, I wanted to briefly outline to you um, what uh, that kind of a quality healthcare experience could look like uh, for a caregiver who is a patient uh, or for a caregiver who is caring for a loved one who is a patient. Um, in this case, uh, meet Jim. Jim is 67. Uh, Jim is also uh, on Medicare um, and he's got a history of hypertension, type two diabetes and anxiety. Um, he is retired, uh, but is also the primary family caregiver to his 70-year-old partner, and his partner has complex health conditions. Um, both are complying with stay-at-home orders since April, uh, so they've had very limited exposure to the outside world, um, outside of uh, maybe just routine errands that need to be made, uh, but on a, on a minimal basis. Now for Jim, how did he find Doctor On Demand? Uh, well, uh, even though he's got a primary care provider, uh, at that time, his primary care provider didn't have the capability of setting up uh, these telehealth or virtual care visits. Uh, so Jim was able to use the HHS telehealth website, which has a virtual care finder, uh, and was able, based on the descriptions that were given, uh, was able to find Doctor On Demand and download uh, our app onto his phone. Um, he wasn't feeling very well, and so he decided to have an in-demand visit uh, and that in-demand visit um, was it looks like we have a lot of script on the on the page there on the slides someone someone's doodling but it's quite all right um, uh, you know Jim was wasn't feeling well was able to have uh, a video based visit uh, in real time with a doctor on demand physician uh, the physician was able to assess uh, Jim um, and that included a behavioral assessment um, as well as checking his blood pressure uh, and his glucose levels since he has a history of, of hypertension and type 2 diet diabetes. Um, it was uh, found out that he, his blood sugar was actually low. Uh, and so the doctor recommended um, some treatments and medications, but also told Jim that he needed to see his primary care provider uh, and at least reach out with a phone call the next day. Um, the doctor in demand physician actually recommended that Jim have a behavioral health referral. Um, and so he referred him to a doctor on demand um, psychologist. Um, um, and so after going through that assessment, he was able to seamlessly schedule a visit with a psychologist um, within a, and, and have a first visit within a couple of days. Um, a few hours later, uh, a member of our care team um, uh, well, in helping him to schedule that visit, they, a member of our care team, our nurse, also followed up with him um, and uh, also ensured that he was just feeling a lot better. So uh, he didn't just have a one-off visit. Uh, he also had the support of just kind of a broader care team to ensure that he was doing well. Um, he has since had a first visit and, and will probably have subsequent visits with his behavioral health provider. Um, but our doctor on demand physician uh, sent his records with his permission to his primary care provider to kind of close that loop. So that kind of just gives you a snapshot of one, how that particular service was made affordable um, and how it valued his time, and two, how he was able to uh, uh, ensure that it was a very secure and private visit, but also get the types of uh, uh, care that he needed, but also the kinds of care that maybe he didn't know he needed with that behavioral health assessment and referral. I think I'm at the end of, of my time, so. Awesome, thank you so much, Latoya. That is a very exciting uh, technology update from telehealth, so I'm very happy about this program you guys are offering. And um, also thank you to the local doodler. Um, th that was something fun, I've never seen that happen before, but. Me neither. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so now it is time for our second poll, so please take a moment to answer the next poll question. 
Which of these are a concern for you at this time? So again, check all the boxes that apply. I'll take a few minutes to do so. This is a lengthy list of options. Oh, and it's a two-parter, I scrolled too quickly. So the second question is, which services are you not receiving that would be useful for you? So once again, there are two questions, number one and number two. You just scroll down, you can answer the second questions. And we've got about a minute left to answer those questions. And feel free to use the chat box if you uh, have other things we did not mention. Diane is mentioning home care day, day program options. Thank you for that, Diane. Yeah, those are a challenge as well. Getting a primary care physician to focus on needs. Good question, Marvin. Maybe we can uh, answer that later in the Q and A. Let's try and come back to that. Okay, so we're showing some results here. So, um, which of these are concern for you at this time? Um, Eighty-nine percent mentioned keeping myself and those close to me from getting sick with COVID nineteen. Yes, very true. Um, taking care of myself emotionally, preparing for the future financially, preparing for future care of loved ones, yes. Um, meeting basic economic needs, food, medications, rent, mortgage during COVID-19, absolutely. Finding a job, a little lower on the percentage, but absolutely a concern. Um, yeah. So regarding this question number one, making sure to have the necessary provisions like toilet paper, paper towels, absolutely. There was there was that concern in the beginning and seems to be managed now, but there could be another surge. Thank you, Jesse, for that information. Uh, overwhelming responsibilities of providing care in absence of any skills. Thank you, Richard. Yeah. Um, Housing, yeah, that is always that is always a challenge. So, um, which services are you not receiving that would be helpful to you? So, looks like emotional support. All right, we need more uh, connection, more validating, more hearing, more empathy, more connection. Yeah, I hear that. Um, then we've got under that looks like financial assistance, financial help, food support. Um, Updated information on COVID-19, employment services. Let's see, uh, transportation services, big one. Respite is needed by many, getting in-person appointments, yes. Yeah. Thanks, you guys, these are all very good. Um, very on the mark. Okay, so moving along. We um, would like to hear from Julie Ugaretz, who is the program coordinator for Sage Connect and Sage's NYC-based friendly visiting program. She graduated from NYU's School of Social Work last May and was also an amazing social work intern last year as well. Welcome, Julie. I'm muted, I'm now I'm unmuted. Thanks, Joey, I'm happy to be here with you. Um, hi, everyone. So today I'm going to share a little bit about SAGE's Friendly Visiting Program and SAGE Connect. 
these are two of our programs that offer social support. So I'll talk about why these, these programs are beneficial for caregivers. Um, and then I'll finish with a couple of stories about client experiences. So the Friendly Visiting Program was founded in 1978 and has been a real cornerstone of the services offered by SAGE. Uh, we know that LGBT elders are more likely to deal with social isolation and the goal of the Friendly Visitor Program was to respond to that. Um, SAGE Connect, which is a phone-based program, uh, began this April as Sage saw the potential for COVID to increase the risk of isolation for a population that was already vulnerable. Um, uh, these programs facilitate a close relationship between two people and that's what makes them special. Uh, it's, this is a relationship that a person who's isolated might not already have access to. Uh, volunteers are uniquely suited to act in the spirit of service. So in other words, their role isn't to be a friend or an ear, just, uh, but also to be a committed helper. Um, another advantage of the particular kind of support that uh, volunteers offer is their ability to be a close confidant while also maintaining an outside perspective, which is really useful um, in gently reframing the things that aren't working. Uh, volunteers are also able to shift as a person's level of needs changes, both on a week-by-week -week basis and over time. Um, and volunteers have the structure of Sage Connect or the Friendly Visiting Program uh, with support meetings and monthly reporting to process any of the difficult emotions that are coming up for them. Uh, and we think this really enables the volunteer to have a steady and a reliable role in the person's life in a sustainable way. Um, I think that at the very least, friendly visiting and other social support programs can offer a caregiver a break a couple of hours each week that they can have back for themselves. Uh, but I also think the impact is much bigger than just adding on some free time. Um, for caregivers, the volunteer can provide some respite from the emotional work of caregiving. A friendly visitor or Sage Connect volunteer can hold some of the care receiver's frustration, anger, sadness, uh, which then frees up some space for the caregiver uh, to then take care of their own emotional needs, which are important. Uh, so this also in turn makes the caregiving relationship more sustainable and provides sort of a release valve for any of the tension that might arise when a person's being cared for. So volunteers really witness the difficult things in a person's life and they're there for that, but they also can remind the person of the things that are meaningful and important in their life. Um, it can be powerful for a volunteer even to ask how a person's day is going. Uh, it shows that they matter beyond their care needs and can restore a sort of sense of shared humanity. So I'll finish by sharing just a couple of stories of the kinds of con connections that get me through Sage Connect and Friendly Visiting. They're really good. Um, so a friendly visitor over the summer brought the person they're working with to a Black Lives Matter rally via FaceTime. Um, this really deepened the connection uh, between the two and also that person's ability to engage with politics. Uh, another visitor sends their match, uh, who's in a nursing home, care packages of their favorite Trader Joe's snacks, which I can imagine is really comforting. Uh, and then Sage Connect matches, it, they do all sorts of things. They watch short films together, they share recipes, they even talk about geology. Uh, we've connected two non-binary people who have a 50 year age difference between them. They both live in Florida and they're both fans of zombie movies, but they otherwise would not have met. Uh, other connections are more long distance. So two men who are close in age, one living in New Mexico, the other in Hawaii both coping with the same issues of social isolation. Uh, so as you see, Sage Connect really does succeed at connecting a group of diverse people uh, with matches that meet their individual needs, particularly in this COVID time. Um, so to finish up, we have volunteers who are ready and eager to help. Um, and we uh, will send out information about this uh, program after today, and we'd love to have you or your care receiver as participants. Thank you. Thank you, Julie. That's 
Sage Connect is a very great program as well as it is national. So thank you for that information. Uh, now we're going to move into our third poll. So for those of you who are long distance caregivers, what would make connecting with the other person who you are caring for easier? Again, choose all that apply. And I think this is just one question this time. So While we're getting those results, I'm wondering, there's a question for Julie about, uh, oh, that Lauren Pongan, never mind, she answered, in terms of yeah. being uh, for older adults and not for, for younger folks. Lauren, you beat me to it. Lauren's on it. Thank you both for being aware though, Bill. Yeah, I think a couple of folks might be joining over the phone, so it's also fine to say that out loud too. Thank you. Okay, any waiting. last poll entries? I'm about to end the poll. Okay, here we go. So it uh, looks like 63% uh, making it easier to connect with aging loved ones virtually. Um, nice, that's definitely something Sage Connect can answer too. Um, and more updates from nursing homes, assisting living centers on loved one's health. Absolutely, Karen highlighted that earlier. Uh, more cheaper ways to provide care amid the pandemic. Yep, paid caregivers during the pandemic. Absolutely, more financial opportunities. Um, yeah, great. Great, these are good. Good sessions, good answers, okay. Um, all right, so now let us move on to, he just mentioned himself. Uh, our, our next panelist is Bill Gross, who has worked at SAGE for almost six years and currently oversees a variety of client-based programs, including SAGE Positives, SAGE Vets, the Friendly Visitors Program, SAGE Connect, and SAGE of South Florida. Um, he has worked with LGBTQ plus nonprofits for almost three decades, starting as a volunteer on uh, HIV counselor at Philadelphia's Mazzoni Clinic and later running programs at Gay Men's Health Crisis and Callum Lord Community Health Center. Please welcome Bill Gross. Thank you, Joey. Um, and Gabriella, you can actually uh, stop the screen sharing for a second. I wanna see people um, because I also wanna do a little exercise. So for those of you who are Zoom proficient, uh, if you know how to put yourself in gallery view, which is where we're all kind of lined up like the Brady Bunch, you know, um, next to each other. And it's up in the right-hand corner of your screen. Uh, and also, if you'd like to turn on your videos for literally about 45 seconds, no pressure, but this is just an opportunity. So I have three questions for you. We've been doing polls, but now I wanna give a, a, a visual response, right? So I'm gonna ask three questions. The first is, by show of hands, caregiving sometimes makes me anxious and stressed out. Okay, and, and you can look around, see who's raising their hand. Good, the second question is you can lower your hand. Sometimes caregiving makes me feel sad. Yeah, that's it. Okay, we've got a bunch. And then the last one, these are easy, I know. The last one is sometimes being a caregiver makes me feel angry. Okay, thank you. Thank you all for doing that. So the reason I do this is because these emotions can be so um, normal for caregivers. And caregiving can be a wonderful, loving, open-hearted experience on one hand, and it can also be really hard in moments, right? So I'm trying to start out by normalizing that. Um, I um, have supervised hundreds of volunteers in caregiving over the years. I've been a primary caregiver myself. And the title of my section is Boundaries and Self-Care. And Gabriella, you can bring up the PowerPoint when you're ready. 
And we can understand that these two concepts are so linked for anyone who's a caregiver, right? Setting boundaries is self-care, right? So, and again, whenever, whenever you have that slide, but I'm just keep gonna keep going, Gabriella. Um, the first bullet point on the slide is it's important to practice saying no, right? And this can be a really um, hard notion for some of us, right? Because often the people we're caring, caregiving for are family, are people we love, are people we've known for a long time. Saying no is important though. And it can just be in little moments, right? I know you want me to do this with you right now, but I just need 45 minutes to get some work done. I just need 45 minutes to walk around the block, right? By using these opportunities to say no, um, we're exercising our sense of agency. And this is really important. We're exercising the fact that we have some choice in the matter because so often for caregivers, the tendency is to kind of get swept away by the needs of the people we're caring for. By drawing boundaries, by saying no, we can actually reduce burnout. We can reduce any feelings uh, of anger that might come up. The second one, and Gabriella, do we have my slide there? I don't see it on the screen. Um, the second one is... Can do people see it? I don't see it, no. The second one is, it's okay, is identifying our triggers right? We all probably have moments of the day, uh, conversations, activities that cause us to be anxious or angry. It's important to just keep an eye on what these are so we can have context. And the next times it happens, we can say, oh, right, I always get a little stressed out when we talk about this or during dinner or something like that. Cultivate support Cultivate layers of support, not just the best friend you sit, you tell everything to, but also the neighbor next door who you don't maybe, you don't tell everything to, but maybe you can talk about what went on on Netflix last night. And lastly, treat yourself. And the main thing, and I know I'm up with my time, the main thing, you know, it can be spending five days away in Atlantic City playing the slots, or it can be going outside, taking some deep breaths. The main thing is the consciousness of, I'm taking care of myself right now. Because it's that consciousness that that's what's gonna change things for us, right? And we can do that every day. Today, I'm treating myself by eating an ice cream. Today, I'm treating myself by dancing around my apartment. There are lots of options. So thank you, I look forward to talking more in the group. Thank you, Bill, that was a lovely reminder and um... Just great interactive moment for all of us. So I appreciate that. And um, so now I would like to introduce Zach Trammell, who is the program coordinator of information and referral systems at the Elder Care Locator. Zach joined the Elder Care Locator in March, 2020. Before joining the Elder Care Locator, Zach worked in mental health and suicide prevention. He is a graduate of Queens University of Charlotte in North Carolina with a Bachelor of Arts in Human Services Studies. Welcome, Zach. Thank you, Joey. Um, hello, so again, my name is Zach Trammell. I am the Program Coordinator for Information and Referral Systems at the Elder Care Locator. Um, the Elder Care Locator is a service of the Administration for Community Living, um, administered by the National Association of Area Agencies on Aging, and for over 25 years, the Elder Care Locator has connected older adults and their caregivers to critical local services and programs. Um, the National Association of Area Agencies on Aging, N4A, um, is a membership association representing America's national network of 622 area agencies on aging um, and providing a voice in the nation's capital for more than 250 Title VI Native American aging programs. Um, next slide. All right, 
So older adults, professionals, and caregivers contact the locator to receive assistance, finding an array of services, including transportation, in-home services, medical supplies, nutrition programs, legal assistance, and housing, just to name a few. And these are some of the things that, you know, people have said in the polls that they have trouble finding or are needing. Um, around 25% of our contacts since March have been from individuals seeking services for someone other than themselves. So we, we do help a lot of caregivers in finding um, those, those programs that they need. Um, I'm gonna walk, do a quick overview of the locator and how you can access services through either our national call center or through our web, website by quickly, um, by quickly using our, our search feature. So on the screen is our toll-free number, our email address and website where you can initiate an e-chat if you want to. Um, you can also contact us uh, using TTY through 711. The Elder Care Locator runs a DC call center, which is generally open Monday through Friday from 9 a.m. to 8 p.m. But since we shifted to telework in March, we've been temporarily closing at 6 p.m., but we are looking to return to 8 p.m. very soon, hopefully. Um, however, even after hours, callers can receive assistance through our voice prompt system, which will allow callers to connect directly to their local agencies, even if an agent isn't available. Next slide. So here on the screen, you'll see the Elder Care Locator website. Users have the option to use the website to connect to their local aging and disability resources. Um, the most frequent used aspect of our website is the agency lookup feature. It's that blue bar um, in the middle of the screen. Um, you have the option to search by your zip code or your city and state. Once you've put in your zip code, you'll be given a list of nine different agency resources, including information and referral, um, area agencies on aging, state units on aging, the Center for Independent Living, Aging and Disability Resource Centers, legal resources, and long-term care ombudsman. Um, if possible, and if you can, if you can navigate two screens, I highly encourage you to pull up the website now. It's um, eldercare.acl.gov. Um, and put in your own zip code or city and state to test it out. Um, there's the two tabs you can sort of pivot between either zip code or city and state. Just make sure you spell your city and city correctly when you do that feature. Um, the elder care locator doesn't like when you misspell um, your own city. Um, once you've pulled up the contact information for your area, you'll see some or all of the nine possible resources available in our database um, for every community in the country. Um, I say some or all of the nine. Um, one of the, the nine options is Title VI programs for Native Americans, and there are some communities that do not have those programs, but the communities that do, you can find that using the either the zip code or the city and state feature. Um, the University of North Dakota administers the National Resource Center on Native American Aging, um, and they maintain the Native American Service Locator that's linked to the locator. Uh, website database. So all of that information is up to date. Um, next slide. So another, another area of our website that's really helpful for caregivers is our caregiver corner. It features um, just some really common questions that our call center team has handled over the years, common questions that you might have as a caregiver, um, such as who can help me with transportation, in-home care, and other support services. How can I get paid to be a caregiver? Who can I call for free or low cost legal assistance? Um, where can I find help understanding Medicare, Medicaid and prescription uh, assistant programs? And, you know, I'm a caregiver, how do I balance the needs of my employer? So take a look at this section as well. Um, this will be sent out to you hopefully um, after the, the session today. Um, and that's all, next slide. So there's our telephone number again and our contact information. I look forward, if you need anything, feel free to reach out to us. Again, we're there Monday through Friday, nine to six Eastern time. Thank you. Thank you, Zach, for the helpful information. Uh, we are now going to move on to our next poll. Uh, so again, please take a moment to respond. The question is, where do you go to access services?
wait a few more minutes for the results to come in. Where do you go to access services? Here we go, okay. Where do you go to access services? 52% um, said the healthcare provider. Uh, let's see, Ooh, okay, good news for us. 48% said SAGE, 48% um, nonprofit organizations other than SAGE. And friends and family right under that, yes, government agencies. Uh, let's see, church, food banks. Yeah, these are good. Thanks for, for participating, everybody. Okay, let me see here. Um, my next presenter is Aaron Key McGovern, JD, is Director of Programs, Center for Benefits Access at the National Council on Aging, NCOA. Aaron oversees NCOA's benefits enrollment centers and Senior SNAP Enrollment Initiative. Are you in class? No. Hello? Please mute yourself if you're not Aaron. Thank you. Thank you, Joey. Um, so as Joey mentioned, I'm with the National Council on Aging and we are a national organization that has a mission of improving the lives of older adults, especially those who are struggling. And we work with community-based organizations across the country to deliver programs that are related to helping older adults age healthy and live well and also improve their economic security. Um, and I work in the Center for Benefits Access and our main goal in the Center for Benefits Access is connecting older adults to benefits that they need to improve their economic security. Next slide, please. So since April, we have been surveying our nationwide network of partners to understand what the needs are of older adults during this time. And we've had over 900 organizations who have completed the survey on um, behalf of the clients that they serve and the impact that COVID-19 has had on their lives and the type of services that they need. Um, and we've gotten responses from organizations in all 50 states, including um, or in addition to Puerto, Puerto Rico. And we've seen responses from all types of organizations, such as senior centers, area agencies on aging, councils on aging, um, ships, and health departments. And what we've seen is that the needs of older adults have changed as the pandemic has continued. So initially we saw that food was the most pressing need and that was either access to food, um, access to benefits to help people afford food or um, meal delivery services. And we think this is mainly because um, many older adults at this time lost access to places where they were traditionally getting meals from. So they might have lost access to their congregate meal site, or they might have been able to grocery shop for themselves in the past, but they no longer felt comfortable going to the grocery store because of concerns around COVID-19 and being becoming infected with the virus. Um, and then as the pandemic continued, we saw the need change to becoming um, a concern about maintaining social connections now that people have been um, staying in their homes for so long as the lockdowns continued or even if lockdowns and restrictions were lifted in their area, they still didn't feel comfortable going back into social situations because they had a higher risk for COVID-19. And as things continued, um, in October, we did the most recent version of this survey and we saw that it had pivoted back to older adults needing assistance affording basic living expenses, such as their prescription medicines, food, housing, and transportation. And we believe this is happening because many of the stim stimulus programs that had started at the beginning of the pandemic, they have run out. There were um, additional supports put in place and um, around certain benefits such as SNAP that 
reduce the need for recertification and those um, are running out at this time as well. So a lot of the support that had initially been in place um, to meet the changing needs of the pandemic has gone away now. And so people are trying to figure out how to adapt to a new, another new situation. Um, and another thing that's not on here is that we've also seen a need around unemployment. Um, and I'm hearing the bell, so we'll move on to the next slide. But we have um, a benefits checkup tool on our website and it's benefitscheckup.org. And this allows you to screen yourself for benefits. We have over 2,500 benefits and you can check your eligibility for things such as Medicare, SNAP, SSI, LIHEAP, which is energy assistance, um, all kinds of different programs. And I know I'm running out of time, so I just wanna also plug, we have mymedicarematters.org and that is two slides forward. Um, and My Medicare Matters can help you pick the Medicare plan that you need. So you can complete a quick screening and provide some of your information and we can help you compare um, different types of Medicare plans, understand the costs that are associated with those plans. And then if you need help um, choosing between a plan, we can also connect you with someone um, to help you make an educated decision about the right plan. Awesome, thank you, Erin. Please make sure uh, we have that information so we can send it in the follow-up email. I know people had questions around this, so yes, thank you for that. Yes, all the links to our sites will, are, will be available in the email. Awesome, thank you so much. So um, now we are going to move into our panel discussion with all of our presenters uh, participating in some of the questions uh, that we have as well as from the audience. Um, so we will go into, um, a question earlier uh, about is, are some of the services only for elders um, because they're trying to figure out resources? But I think we might have already answered this one um, in the chat that this is focused towards towards um, elder care at this point. This, um, this Joey, I just wanted to say with our benefits checkup tool, it does ask you for age information. And if there are benefits programs that are available for people who are under 60 but disabled, those programs will come up in benefits checkup. Awesome. Love that. So yeah. it gives you another resource. Amazing. And Joy, I'd like to add that with Doctor in Demand, our healthcare services are, are available to patients across the life cycle. So you could be as young as two if you're caring for uh, children um, or uh, those that you have guardianship over. Uh, certainly, uh, we're available to those over the age of 65. Right now, we are uh, fully covered for Medicare Part B beneficiaries, and a lot of that has to do with the COVID waivers. Um, but we're also available through many uh, Medicare Advantage plans, some of the ones that Aaron mentioned as well. But we're also available to um, those receiving TRICARE, so some of our retired uh, and active uh, military and their families, um, commercial insurance, but you can also pay out of pocket too. Awesome. Thank you, Latoya, for that update. That's great. And um, sorry, just to chime yes. in, the Elder Care Locator, um, while our name is Elder Care um, and our primary audience is people over the age of 60, we do um, offer some resources for people under the age of 60 with disabilities as well. So if you're looking for that, I highly encourage you to connect with us. Thank you, Zach. This is great. Um, so to follow up, we had another audience question about um, the services that we've presented. Are they available for people who are undocumented and are there resources available it, other than English? Yes. Oh, sorry. Um, so at the Elder Care Locator, we do have a team of Spanish speaking um, information specialists. We also have the ability to connect with multiple languages through an interpreter service. Um, the Older Americans Act does not um, specifically say anything about citizenship or being documented, so those services are available. Um, the locator doesn't provide services directly, so I'll just put that <clears throat> little asterisk beside that. We help you get connected to your local agency, typically the area agency on aging, and they're the ones who administer the programs and the services. Yeah, Doctor in Demand, because we're a healthcare provider, uh, we don't turn anyone away. Um, and so uh, our services are covered by many insurers, including some of the public ones like Medicaid in New York and Minnesota, um, but also with Medicare as well. But again, you have the option of paying out of pocket. Um, uh, and then, you know, you can, you can find more information about uh, how to access some of that information either through our website um, or downloading the app itself. 
Yeah, and for benefits checkup, we have benefits checkup available in English or in Spanish. And if you complete a screening, um, one of the questions in benefits checkup will ask you about your citizenship status. And so if, if a benefit does require you to have citizenship, um, it won't come up if you don't select your citizen. So there, depending on your status, there are different benefits that are available and that can help um, weed through those benefits options. I, I do just want to add one other thing. We do have access to translative services, uh, not just for those for which English is not their first language, but also ASL services as well. Um, some of our healthcare providers, as you're going through our directory, might list that they are speaking more than one, or they might be proficient in more than one language, um, or you can opt for some of our translation services. Great, great information, guys. Thank you so much. Um, there's a question, <laughs> excuse me, about languages in Sage Connect. Um, yeah. That was, oh, I see it's private to me, but I'll share it with everyone. Um, <laughs> Sage Connect is, is available to anyone regardless of citizenship status and anything like that. And we, um, yeah, we have some Spanish speaking volunteers and definitely can also match people with, with other language speakers. Thank you, Julie. Um, that's great. I was actually going to ask Sage Connect a question about um, can a caregiver receive support through Sage Connect in addition for a person they're caring for? So can a caregiver and or care receiver get the Sage Connect uh, volunteer call? Yes, absolutely. Um, great. Most call receivers are over 50. Um, yeah. Great. Thank you for clarifying that. And um, Karen, I'd just like to jump back into what would you say is the most difficult part of you uh, that you dealt with in the nursing home lockout? Clear, clearly the non-communicativeness of the administration. You know, the staff there do an amazing job under, under difficult circumstances and they're given no backup from the administration. They're total, the, the people at the top are very cowardly. They, they, they have the frontline, the day-to-day -day staff uh, relate to the public, but they don't give them any resources that are helpful. They, all they can do is say, no, we can't do this. So and they're, they're, they're in the middle. They're wonderful. You know, the aides and the nurses and you know, the doctors are good. They're competent. They somehow kept my mother alive through all of this, you know, but in terms of any, e just an email, they could do that. Every, you know, every month or week, it wouldn't kill them just to say, hey, we know you're there you know, things like that. Right, some more support on that. More Thank support. you for showing that, Karen. Let's see here. And we have a question regarding, oops, let's minimize my screen. Pull that back up here. Um, Lauren, feel free to populate any questions yeah. from the chat. I, I can't was, I was just gonna say, we do have another question from the okay. audience. Um, at what age does elder care start? I am 60 and disabled. You can reach out to the elder care locator. We help individuals 60 years of age or older or people under the age of 60 with disabilities, so. Um, so one question is, are there support groups for caregivers? Yes, yes, there are several support caregiver uh, groups right now um, happening uh, all on Zoom uh, through, through our SAGE caregiver support group. Um, through DIFTA, yep, Jesse, thank you, Jesse Schwartz, um, who's also part of a caregiving program as well. So yeah, we have those. Um, we will also follow up with more information uh, in the email as well, um, including an opportunity at SAGE coming up. So um, I wanted to follow up with, um, with Bill uh, for in your presentation, you said you had a couple more self-care tips. Um, <laughs> If so, could you summarize them quickly for us? Yes, I can summarize them quickly. I, I would give two more, right? That I, they couldn't fit on the slide. Um, one is besides taking care of ourselves emotionally, right? One thing for caregivers is that we tend sometimes not to take care of ourselves physically. So really keeping an eye on that, right? We wanna make sure that we're going 
to a doctor often, to our primary care doctor often. We wanna make sure that we're keeping our appointments even though we're caring for someone else, right? That's real important. And I guess the second one is just, you know, I saw in the chat, a lot of people, some people were saying, oh, I didn't, I didn't realize it was normal to maybe feel angry sometimes or sad sometimes, right? Or anxious sometimes. Um, that's why something like a caregiver support group can be so useful because it can normalize those emotions. Because what we don't want to do is be caring for someone, start feeling a little angry or annoyed sometimes and, and saying, oh, Bill, you are a bad person for feeling angry right now, right? That doesn't help us at all. So I would just say, try to, to accept that those are some of the emotions that come up and seek out some support from other caregivers. Thank you, Bill. That's great. Um, so we are going to jump into our last poll question. Um, we are preparing seven or eight more of these, so please answer honestly and candidly. Um, all, ultimate, all multiple choice questions are anonymous, so please set up poll number five. Thanks, Joey. And this, and when Joey says we're planning seven or eight more of these as a collective, we're planning more of these webinars to give resources to folks. So this is the first one and we really appreciate any feedback you have. Absolutely, thank you, Lauren. Um, so how useful was this listening session for you? And then there's a second follow-up question, which is what's one thing you learned about in this webinar that you plan to use? our poll results. So how useful was this listening session to you? 50% said very useful, 37% extremely useful, some somewhat useful, not so useful, and good news for us, nobody found it not at all useful, so that's good. And uh, what's one thing you learned about this webinar that you plan to use? Navigating benefits, great, great. Thank you, Zach and Aaron, for that. Um, let's see what else we've got. Followed up telehealth, hearing from uh, experiences about caregivers, nice. Boundaries and self-care, good. Um, let's see, it looks like other follows, and then there's some, some descriptions in the chat. Um, connecting with loved ones from a distance, always important, and accessing services for adults in rural settings. So actually, um, that leads into the closing section, which uh, to access a rural sort of, um, I guess, uh, well, I'm reading at the same time, not good at multitasking. Anyways, uh, the SAGE website has many resources, including those uh, for rural support uh, to support the community. So please go to sageusa.org for more information, including national resources. So I would like to highlight the DIFTA, uh, Department for the Aging Caregivers Program, offering supportive resources to caregivers with respite support, social programming, home safety assistance, and supportive counseling, including support group, as someone and, uh, asked earlier. Uh, the current caregiver support group is uh, predominantly in the NYC area for what we have going on. Um, in fact, we have a five-week caregivers circle training beginning next week that will focus on adapting caregiver support during the pandemic. So we will also follow up with an email letting you know more information about that. Um, but you must reside in the, in the uh, five boroughs. Well, one of you, a caregiver and or care receiver. So um, we will follow up with that email with some helpful resources, contact information, and next steps to receive the thank you gift for participating. If you have any suggestions for how this webinar could have gone better, topics you have like you would have liked to learn about, or suggestions for future events, please type them into the chat now or email us. We'd love to hear your feedback, so thank you in advance. In closing, I wanna take a moment to honor all of you for the work that you are doing as caregivers and or care recipients in the caregiving relationship. 
This is an especially challenging time, and we at SAGE, the Diverse Elders Coalition, and the National Alliance for Caregiving, thank you for caring for your loved ones and community, and we are here to support you. We hope you found this session informative and supportive, and please remember to take some time for you and affirm the support you give through some self-care. You are incredible and inspiring people, and you need care too. Once again, we will send a follow-up email and share additional resources with you. A special thank you to all that put this together. Uh, at Sage, I'd like to thank Jose, Bill, Julie, Irene, Steve, Patrick, Cheryl, and Bell, uh, and the DEC and NAC team for making today possible. Anything else, Lauren? Nope, just thank you so much, everyone. Thanks for all of the feedback and the chat and the polling and Huge thank you to Karen for opening our session with her story and getting us all um, in that place and bringing us into that experience with you. So thanks everyone. And thank you so much, Joey, for your great emceeing. Yay, thank you everyone. And, and absolutely, thank you, Karen, as well. Thanks everyone for participating. Take care, have a lovely rest of your Thursday. Thank Bye. you.